uh, the women left and, and went down to Lake Geneva for a couple of days, and Marianne's parting words to me were, well, were don't do anything stupid. And <laughs> that's always a good catch. Yeah. So I'm on top of the top of my ladder, pressure washing the side of my house, and uh, I'm on the top of the ladder, and you know you're in trouble. In the back of your mind, you're thinking, now if I fall, Marianne's not here to take me to the hospital. So I saw the neighbor washing her car, and I thought, she'll hear me scream. So as that's rolling through my mind, my son-in-law comes and stands at the base of the ladder and screams, hey, and I'm on the top of my little giant ladder with the pressure washer, and needless to say, I almost went tumbling down. But uh, so I told Marianne, I said, I tried not to do anything too stupid. So whenever there's ladders involved with guys and things like that, and and there's no one around, you always got to be thinking twice. So um, anyway, it's raining this morning, and uh, I thought it was very fitting. I bring in my umbrella, and uh, these are really handy. And I'm not going to sing singing in the rain, unless you really want me to. But uh, (laughs) yeah, Um, so umbrellas are great, aren't they? And what comes to your mind when you think of an umbrella? Rain? What? Thorn? Storms? Okay. Okay, well, good. Well, today we're going to talk a little bit about God's umbrella of protection. God's umbrella of protection. And 2 Peter deals with authority and submitting to authority. And it's interesting that we see God as being authoritative and being all-powerful And he gives us this umbrella of protection, and it's called authority. And uh, you can't help but turn on the news and see what's going on in places around the country when authority fails to do what authority needs to do, and people lose respect for authority. What do we have? We have complete anarchy. We have complete insanity, be it in your home, be it in the workplace, being it in, in the community or in the world, when we lose touch with reality and the purpose of authority and we lose respect for authority, we get into big trouble, don't we? We're in huge trouble. And so as we watch the news and we see what's going on in the world around us, we have to stop and ask, so what is, what is the answer? What is the answer? Well, Second Peter, uh, or excuse me, First Peter is dealing with this. We're in the second chapter. And there was a lot of unrest in this time. Uh, if you remember Nero, if you remember your history classes, anything about Nero, he wasn't a nice guy, okay? And so when Peter is writing this, uh, Nero's very much alive and well, and he's a very unjust man. He was a crazy person, to say the least. So when he's talking about authority, and also slavery was huge. There were almost as many slaves as there were free people in the Roman Empire. They were huge on slavery. So uh, these were people who were under the authority of slaves, good slaves, uh, masters and bad masters, uh, authoritative power in government that wasn't necessarily good. And so, you know, you can say we can relate to a lot of these things today in the world, the culture we're living in today. Some of you have worked for people who are very bad uh, bosses. Some of you are working for people like that right now. Some of you are in abusive situations and you understand uh, that you're in that tough place. So God gives us some help with this this morning. And uh, being under God's umbrella of protection, uh, we need to understand that it is God's desire. And one of the hardest doctrines in the Bible is the doctrine of submission, right? I mean, we talk about that a lot, about husbands and wives and children's submission. We, by nature, are rebellious. Isaiah 53, 6 says, we've all gone our own way. And that pretty much summarizes the heart of man, and it summarizes the world we live in today. We've all gone our own way. We all want to be in charge. We all want to be in control. We can all do it better than fill in the blank. We we find ourselves in these tough places today, but God's answer to anti-authority then and now is the Word of God and our relationship with the living God. Because if we don't understand how to be authority in, under authority in the home as we grow up, what are we going to have when we get these individuals, young people growing into adulthood or going out into the world? If you don't un- understand how to be under authority in the home, good luck with living it in the world. You're going to suffer immensely if you don't understand this principle. So if you want to turn to Second Peter verses 13 through 24, we're going to look at this. And, and, and the title of my message t- today is, For the Lord's Sake. 
we submit to authority for the Lord's sake. Or the idea of submission is to place under. It's a military term, which means stand in line or to be under rank, to be, to be in authority is to be this idea of when you're in the military, they don't make suggestions to you normally. They have things they call orders, right? And when they give you an order, it isn't like, well, I'm, I'll decide whether I'm going to get up. You know, they're telling me to get out of bed. I don't know that I want to get out of bed at this time. How's that going to work for you? It doesn't work in the military. They give you an order. You have to fulfill that order. Even if, even if it means advancing into enemy fire and you might perish, you have an order. God gives orders, and God wants us to understand that under his perfect umbrella of protection of authority, when we submit to authority, God blesses our lives. So, verse 13 here states this, Submit yourselves to the Lord's, for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men. <clears throat> there is that, that clear statement here from Peter who was directed by the Holy Spirit of God to write these things down. And this was written quite a few years ago, but it applies to us today. Submit yourself for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men, whether the king as supreme authority or to the governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. So in our government and in our structure that we have, there are laws in place to punish those who do wrong and reward those who, who, are, who do right. So in, in a perfect environment, in a perfect world, there is a, a, there is a balance. But even in a world that is filled with sin, we still have this imbalance because there's good and there's evil, right? There's right and wrong. There's all these aspects of, um, of um, life. And it was interesting, I went for a little motorcycle ride yesterday with uh, one of the guys from church. He has a white motorcycle and I have a black motorcycle. And we pulled in and she goes, it's kind of like the devil and God. And I'm like, I got the black bike, so I guess I was the <laughs> devil. And the other guy had a white bike. And I thought, isn't it, isn't it interesting, even in our subconscious, there's this concept of, of right and wrong, good and bad. So it, is, it goes with authority. And unfortunately today, what's so sad is, Young people are looking at authority today and saying, I don't know if I want to listen or submit to that. I don't know that I want to follow rules and regulations. We have metal detectors in our schools. We, uh, we, we live in a place now where, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of scary. You know, every situation you go into, there's all this protection. And, and yet we have more and more anarchy going on around us. Even though there's more and more things in place to protect us, we recognize that we can't protect ourselves from anything. As much as we think we can, uh, we, we can't. But God has a remedy. So let's move on here. He talks about the governors. And, and verse 15, For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Live as free men, but do not use your freedom as a cover for evil. Live as servants of God. And what I, what I look at in the idea of, you know, we all have different spheres of, of places we live, and it's work and home and school and church and government and all these areas. And so when he tells us about submitting to these areas of authority, it's important. But he says here, and he's telling these people in this time, that live your life in such a way that people cannot bring reproach against you. Live your life in such a way as a Christian that people are going to look at you and say there's something different. If you're a slave, and we're going to get to that a little further along, if you are a slave, obey your master and do it and, and serve well as you serve your master. And we can't begin to get our minds around slavery. Um, a quote from Aristotle uh, talked about the fact that oh, men were basically, slaves were nothing more than like tools and we have nothing in common. Nothing in common. So they, a slave was, was like if you guys got a cordless screwdriver or a, a waffle iron at home, ladies, or whatever, a slave was nothing more than a tool to be used and discarded. They had no rights at all. They weren't even considered human beings by some. So when we're talking about context here of slavery and the conditions that they worked under, they weren't, they weren't considered even human. They were just things to be used and discarded when they were done with them. So to, to sit and listen to this kind of teaching, it had to be difficult. But we understand that when we look at the big picture that God who is in authority, the creator and sustainer of all things, he is God, he is absolutely in control, he is omniscient, he's uh, omnipresent, and, and he, is, he is perfectly God 
over here as this umbrella of authority. And then we see the reverse we're going to see as we end up here. Jesus is just the opposite. When God sent the Son, Christ, to die on this earth, he humbled himself, submitted to the cross, and was crucified, died and was buried and rose from the dead. We just celebrated that at Easter. So you have God the Father up here who is perfect authority, and then his Son Jesus came to the lowest, to be the lowest he took on the sin of all the world, perfectly innocent, where none of us are innocent. He's perfectly innocent. God humbled himself and became a servant and even died the death of the cross. So God the Father, perfect authority. Jesus, the perfect picture of submission in under cruel, unjust conditions. And, and we just went through Easter, all the, the illegal trials and how he was mistreated and, and betrayed and uh, his friends turned his back on him, everything. So God the Father, perfect authority, Jesus, perfect submission. So we have the, the absolute top of who we see as our Father, and then we see the absolute bottom of Christ being willing to humble himself. So when we look at this picture in between here of authority and submitting to authority, none of us will ever suffer as Christ suffered. So we see these truths in the teaching of Peter that are the thread through this whole key area here. Then he goes on to say here, in verse 17, show proper respect to everyone, love the brotherhood of believers, fear God, honor the king. Boy, I'll tell you, that's, again, a difficult thing sometimes to do when we have authority that we struggle with. And, and I believe that, uh, you know, if we were in, China, in a communist country, I was reading somebody who was recently in, in China, a pastor, and he was talking about how they have to be so careful with their jargon and terminology in China. You don't go up to someone and say, are you a believer? Do you believe in Jesus? The way they, they respond without getting into trouble is to say, we're like-minded. We're like-minded. Someone asks you, what do you believe? Or, and they'll share a little bit. He had a tour guide, and he was talking to this tour guide, and the tour guide said, well, in a very quiet, still voice, I'm like-minded. You've got to be so careful what you say and who, do, who you say it to, or you can go to jail. So being under authority, a, a authority system that, that doesn't allow you the freedom to express your faith is something that very few of us will ever grasp. And I'm sure by the time our children or our grandchildren grow up, our country will be in that place where we will not have the freedom to express how we feel. We're moving that way. Uh, it's, it's becoming more and more evident every day. So anyway, this idea of honoring the king no matter what, and uh, Proverbs says this. I love this in Proverbs 10.8 says, The wise in heart accept commands, but the chattering fool comes to ruin. Isn't that good? I just love it. The wise in heart accepts commands. One of, one of the hardest things to do is to accept commands, especially when you work for somebody. And we've all been there. We've worked for someone and they're telling us to do something a certain way. And we look at that and say, that doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. Well, and so we can maybe argue sometimes, and sometimes maybe the, the boss is willing to listen. But nevertheless, we have to submit to what they tell us to do, unless it's breaking the law, unless they want us to lie or steal or break the law. Uh, that's a different story. Then I believe we have every right to say, no, we're not going to do that, and recognize you may lose your job. Um, <clears throat> when I started... Uh, doing fires, fire restoration in my business, I had a, a huge hotel fire I was involved in. And uh, I was, I was going to be hired uh, by this company if I was willing to pad my, my bill. They wanted me to basically double my bill so that the contractor who hired me would make a lot of money for really doing nothing, giving me the job. And I had to walk away from it. And it was in a time in my business, I really needed that business. But there's no way I was going to do that. And he said, well, you're, you, this will be the last time. Well, I didn't even work for him. He said, this will be the last time I'll be calling you. And I'm like, I'm good with that. You know, and this, this uh, so, you know, we find those places and in times in our lives where we have to stand and do the right thing. I mean, that was a no-brainer. But, you know, part of you, sometimes you hesitate and you think, well, it, I, th this is kind of a gray area here. God wants us to stand and do what's right. Under his, being under his authority is number one. So next part here is being God conscious. Verse 18, slaves, submit yourselves to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. And uh, this idea here in the Greek has the idea of being twisted, morally twisted. So what he's saying here is, 
if you have a boss who might even be morally twisted, corrupt, he's telling them you have to submit to this individual in this situation. And this was the culture that they were in. Now, there's a time where you, if you are being told to do something unethical, immoral, unbiblical, again, you have to make a choice. But if you're a slave, you're forced sometimes to do things you don't want to do. That's a tough spot. So those are the times you have to just commit those things to God and say, if I don't do this, maybe they're going to kill me or whatever. Those are tough lines in that. And so for us, hopefully we'd be willing to die for what's right. We would hope that. But anyway, let's move on here. The idea of being harsh. Uh, Verse 19, For it is commendable if a man bears up under pain of unjust suffering because he is conscious of God. To bear up under unjust suffering is having a sensitivity and a consciousness of God. How is that that possible? Well, when we understand where God has us in our lives sometimes, we're there by God's appointment, and if God wants you somewhere else, he's going to move you somewhere else. And those are tough times when you realize, okay, God has me in this situation. I have to to make a choice. What am I going to do? Well, if, if it's not breaking the law, unethical and moral, you have to submit to that authority. But again, we find ourselves in situations where we're, we're asked to do things continually in, in the world we live in. And so we have to find out where do we stand, where do we draw the line. And, and one of the things of authority is praying for the authority that we're under. I don't know that we do enough of that to pray for the authority that we're under. Scripture tells us we're to pray for all authority, but to pray for that authority we're under and being willing to do the right thing no matter what. And I know people who've lost their jobs, who've left their jobs, because they couldn't do, uh, do what the, their employer wanted them to do. And uh, corruption today, if, if any of you work anywhere at any length of time, you find corruption on so many different levels, no matter where you are. And so standing and doing what is right is, is, is the God-honoring thing to do and recognizing who ultimately is in control. Who will I answer for? at the end of the day. And sometimes it brings financial struggles when we do the right thing. But I believe God will bless us as we go through those difficult times. That is commendable, that we are conscious of God. I think one of the most important things is the fact that we understand that we are accountable to God. We are under God's authority. God is directing us and guiding us through life. And sometimes we come to those places that are tests. And uh, you know, you might find yourself in a situation where it's almost like a test. And uh, I remember finding, I remember um, finding a, a wallet one time, and it had all the uh, had quite a bit of money in it. And, and of course, uh, I you know I, I called the person, found the wallet, gave them the money. They were shocked that I didn't take the money out of the wallet. They were like, I didn't think there'd be any money left in here. And I'm like, well, why not? You know, but but they really expected the wallet. They were first first of they were glad to get their wallet back. They were shocked that the money was still in the wallet. To me, that's kind of like not a big deal. But nevertheless. We live in this situation where the lines are being blurred. Verse 20 says this, But how is it, to your credit, if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it, but if you suffer for doing good and endure it, this is commendable before God. So sometimes, uh, you know, you may have been in situations where you have, you you know, you maybe lost your job because you did the right thing and, uh, you you know, you, you could have suffered or lied or whatever and, those are those tough times and uh, when you get caught. I remember being caught with some friend of mine shoplifting and uh, um, we got caught shoplifting. I was just a little guy and, and uh, I had to find out whether I was going to turn my friend in or not. And, and uh, basically, I didn't know they had him in the other room. But uh, yeah, we had to do the right thing and so I squealed. And uh, he squealed on me and we laughed afterwards, but it was kind of like, you know what? We did the right thing and... Uh, I got a good beating when I got home, uh, you know, which I think is a good thing. Okay, I'm not saying child abuse, but I'm saying that sometimes, you know, the, the Board of Education across the seat of understanding can do wonders, can do wonders. So anyway, let's move on here. So if we suffer for doing good, it's commendable for, before God. Ultimately, we're all going to stand before God someday. What we do in this life, the decisions we make, the choices we make, so important. Verse 21, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, before you, and for us. So we realize that God has allowed us to come into a world, there's suffering, and that's part of life. 
leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. So when we understand that God is in this process of working in my life and sometimes the suffering and the struggle I'm going through is God's building God's character in our lives, and that's a hard thing to do, but to go through, but he is doing this process in our lives of doing the right thing because if we're truly a follower of Christ, and if they were followers of Christ, they would do the right thing by living an example and realizing, you know, sometimes people have prosperity gospel theology where you come to Jesus and all your problems go away and you make money and you get money and everything's wonderful. Well, that isn't the way it works. Most of the time in the early church, if you became a Christian, you were displaced. Uh, James has written, it says that a church is scattered because of persecution. They were scattered. They lost their homes. They lost their families. They lost their loved ones. They lost everything. The early church, there was persecution. Other parts of the world, there's persecution. So I can't allow that to influence what I'm doing or not doing. I have to understand that God's called me to live a life for him. And part of it is suffering and going through this life. Anyway, in 22, he says this, he committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. So when I look at this idea of Christ suffering and we understand he had no sin, I understand I'm a sinner, we're all sinners. So let's look at this next point here. Verse 23 says this, when they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. There may be things that you're going through in your life or you've gone through in your life um, and, you know, someone might misunderstand something you've done or something you've said. You know what? It may never be settled in this life. It may be in your next life it's settled. Somebody's maybe accused you of doing something or saying you lied or someone threw you under the bus and you're perfectly innocent and there's nothing you can do to clear your name or to justify what's happened. So you just, as a friend of mine said, sometimes you just have to keep your mouth shut and let God vindicate you. Those are tough things to go through. Those are difficult things to go through because we tend to want to justify ourselves or, or it wasn't me or I'm innocent in this. You know what? Sometimes as the world moves on, and there's going to come a day where I believe just being a Christian, we're guilty. If you're a Christian and you love Jesus Christ, you're guilty no matter what you're guilty of this or guilty of that, it's just going to be lumped together no matter what. It's like you're wrong no matter what. So this next part here, I just love love this because it is such a great truth. Verse 24, Peter tells us this, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins or in sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed. For you were like lost sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. And what I love about this truth here is what, what Peter's telling us, we start with Father, the umbrella of protection. We come under his authority. We come under his protection. We follow his principles in life. And when we follow his principles and we, we uh, honor authority, God blesses us. And even sometimes when it's difficult, God still blesses us. And sometimes in this life, we may not necessarily be blessed for doing the right thing, but ultimately we understand we we stand before a perfect, holy, just God. And there will be justice for everybody and everything that's ever happened, for everything in this life that you've ever looked and said, this is unjust, there's no justice. There will be justice. There will be that day in court where justice will be served because God is perfectly holy and because God hates sin and he dealt with it on Calvary doesn't mean that people are going to just be able to get through this life with a free get free card. So that's part of by his wounds we've been healed. As I was studying this, I look at the fact that God being all powerful and all knowing through the death of Christ, he gives us this, this capacity to be healed. Well, what does it mean to be healed? Well, um, one, of, one of the pictures is physical health. Well, we know that we're all perishing, and, and I do believe God does miracles today. I do believe God still heals people today. But for the most part, even in Jesus' life, he didn't heal everybody he came in contact with physically, but he gave everyone an opportunity to be healed spiritually through Calvary. You see, we were separated by our sin. We were lost We were sinners, and Christ came and healed us, gave us the capacity to be born again, to start over, to have a new life, a new nature, a new capacity. We no longer have to sin. We're free to live as free men in a a world that's crazy. 
We've get, been given the power of the Holy Spirit. So this idea of healing, uh, one of the names of God is Jehovah Rapha. And, and I love this. It says, this is a, the quote, I am the Lord who heals. I am the Lord who heals. And I, I love that. In the Old Testament, that was one of his names. And when you study the names of God, they're pretty amazing. But the idea of healing is to repair or restore. Well, you see, we were dead separate. We were separated from God. So he has restored this relationship of our old nature, given us a new nature. He now gives us a capacity to have a relationship with God because that was what was broken. We were dead spiritually. So we've been restored to a place where now we can have spiritual health. And here, here's the important thing we need to understand. We can be physically sick and emotionally sick and spiritually sick, but God gives us the power through the person of the Holy Spirit, the truth, to heal us first spiritually. But you know what? We can't separate the spirit from the emotional, the psychological, or even the physical. There's our bodies, there's our, our psyche, our spirits, and there's and our emotions, and then there's our capacity for spiritual things. So when we put this all together, what am I saying? Some of us, in James talks about this, some, of, some people were partaking of communion, and they were getting sick because they weren't dealing with the sin issues in their life. Christ dealt with our sin, but you know what? Sometimes we have sin issues with other people, brothers and sisters in the church, family members, co-workers, employers, um, whatever. So, so as a result, that can affect your health. It can, it can affect your health, the, the spiritual aspect of your life. So, so it's so important that we keep a, a, a clean calendar, if you would, or accounts with God. And that's why that we're going to have communion here in a few minutes. It's so important that we take time every once in a while to recognize, you know, Christ has given me, he's healed me, but am I taking advantage of everything he's given me to live a healed life? Am I dealing with the sin in my life or my past sin that I've never really dealt with? The, uh, uh, conversion to Jesus Christ, Christianity is, I recognize I'm a sinner and I need a savior. And I can't save myself. And you know what? Sometimes in our illnesses, we, get up, we can make ourselves sick. You talk to doctors and I was, just, I was just reading something recently about how many illnesses are psychosomatically related how many illnesses, how many people literally have made themselves sick and are sick because they don't have the proper relationship with God or they have no relationship with God. And we Christians, we, you know, we've got these monsters in our closets of things that we've never dealt with in our lives, guilt or anger, bitterness, whatever it is, and it's literally making you sick. So when you, when you and, I, and the beauty, is it, beauty of it is, is you just bring it to the great physician, to the heavenly father and say, God, I'm dealing with this. I need you to help me with this area of my life. I can't forget. I can't forgive this person. Or I'm so bitter. I'm so angry. And you don't even know you're angry and bitter. Man, those things just eat away at you, don't they? I mean, we've all been there. I mean, I mean, none of you are acknowledging me right now, but, and that's okay. But there's these things that, that just get a hold of you. God wants us to free us. So this, either that or this statement is a lie. This is, this is a fallacy. If this, if, if this statement says, by his wounds you've been healed, well, what did he mean by that? Was he just fooling around? Peter didn't have anything else to write in there? This is a truth, a biblical truth. When we give up this stuff to the Lord, he heals us. He healed us at Calvary, past, present, future sins. But some of us are dragging around these tumors, these tumors that we're not dealing with. And we need to deal with them. And, and God has given us everything we need to deal with these things by just coming to him. And then he goes on to say here, he, we return to the good shepherd. Jesus is the good shepherd, the shepherd of our souls, the overseer of our souls. So here we see again this picture of he is our authority. We are under the shepherdship of Jesus Christ. We're under his authority. But what did Jesus do to earn, to earn the right to, for us to be under his authority? He became a man, innocent, was wrongly convicted, and was crucified, the worst form of death there was, mistreated, beaten, abused, and he was sinless. He was perfectly innocent. We get upset when, when guilty people are mistreated. Well, he was perfectly holy and perfectly just. 
So here's this reality again. God the Father, the umbrella of protection, and Jesus Christ has earned the right by dying on a cross to purchase us back. He bought us. We were all slaves. He bought us out of the slave market of sin. He paid the price for us. Now we're free. We belong to him. We're slaves to Christ, if you would. Wow, what a great master we have. What a great God we have. He has bought us with a price. We belong to him. So the, the key is, are you living like that? Are you living like that? If you don't understand what that is, you're really missing out on all the abundant possibilities of life. And I, my heart breaks for you. Well, we're going to take communion, and uh, I just uh, want us to just transition to that. We'll be taking the elements together, and I just want us to kind of get focused on this. And let me just pray as the, the men come forward. Father, we come to you, and you are perfect, holy authority. You have the right, you own everything, belongs to you. We belong to you. You purchased us with the blood of your own son, Jesus Christ. And so, Father, you want us to live under authority. Help us to learn how to live with and under authority. And God, we do pray for those who are over us. We pray for our government leaders. We pray for our community leaders. We pray for our bosses. We pray for our neighbors, husbands, wives, parents of children. Father, we come before you realizing that you are the author of authority. And so, Father, we submit ourselves to you. And Lord, I pray you'd search our hearts today so that we might understand what it is to have been healed by you and that the desire you have for us to sense that healing in Jesus' name. Amen.